Uh, Anuruddha, uh, I would like to beg that uh, where I work is also our Bengal. And uh, this has been a lovely experience to be there. And uh, this is this place which has offered us opportunity to learn from what we call the unreached. I, I really don't agree to this definition. But I agree to the definition which Mr. Francis uh, uh, suggested. I mean, people are staying away from the what we call mainstream, and this has offered us opportunity to learn something from them. Uh, rather than offering something to the tribal people, CDHI and its team has been endeavoring to learn from them to see what they really need, to see what meaning they have in whatever they do, including technology. And this is what I'm going to share with you. So many, many thanks for the organizers to have invited me. And uh, this, uh, again, Tarunda has been very, very instrumental in uh, having us here together, and I'm really uh, so enlightened to hear earlier to his speakers, which has been so, you know, so uh, satisfying. Uh, I'm a social psychologist, as my introduction reads. Uh, I have not been a hard technology person, and uh, been with the tribal communities in North Bengal over 20, 25 years. We have been able to see how a technology is perceived by them when it comes from outside, how they adopt and how their own technology or how their own inside the knowledge is registered. And as a result, whatever we carry for them, it doesn't do very well with them. There are also examples that I will cite in this in this process that wherever they have involved themselves, where they have been allowed freedom, they have been able to evolve arrangements which work much better than what may come from outside. So uh, this is uh, what brings me here to share with you. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Francis that, you know, Andrist is quite Christian and I would not like to go by that. <laughs> For me, Andrist is, 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 is those who have a very, very different life and about whom the perception is very different. More than them living a very different life in isolated places, the perception of all of us who are called the mainstream people, the perception about them is very different. Be it they live in jungles, they live in mountains, they live in uh, slightly away from the road or remote from the road. They are considered as somebody and I would like to say that they are, their wisdom, their understanding is not valid. Often it comes, you know, they don't know, they don't understand because they are not educated. So for me, the unreached are people who suffer from these blames, which they really don't deserve. Uh, so for us, the unreached in the context of this seminar are those who are not in the, in, in the, in the mainstream, who are considered inferior, who are neglected, and when it comes to their wisdom, it's not given any importance. At the same time, I would, I consider them as unreached, who are still upfront in coming out with ideas, who, are, who don't hesitate to say what they feel like saying. And uh, so for, for us, the unreached are, 
are this group of people, this category of people. The intention of this seminar must be to, uh, to come out with recommendations, to come out with understanding which can suggest that this kind best suit the unrest. I am not sure whether it will, it will work or not. Then my understanding is that the connect between technology and the unrest is not linear or straightforward. If we think that given a technology, it will benefit the, the unrest, I, I have some problems in, in having a tone with this. Because the, the, the tech, there is a very complex line which has social, cultural, psychological, political underpinnings. So technology straight away does not, uh, cannot help the unreached. So what did it do? So all that Mr. Solanke has talked about and my question was on how women uh, participation is perceived by the community. In the same way, I, I, I have the, the situation where if an unreached, a tribal or a marginal farmer come out with certain innovation, how it is perceived like, how people who are supposed to provide technological support can do this. Uh, here we have a term which is called, uh, and I, I know uh, people should be aware about it, this is cognitive justice. Cognitive justice suggests that the knowledge and wisdom is very important for everybody and there has to be justice. Everybody's knowledge and perspective has to be respected, has to be valued and has to be seen in the context of how it can change he, her or even global, you know, the life. So, in my view, in our view, the cognitive justice is central to the ethos of social justice. Uh, but if we have this justice, then we will not technology for the country. And uh, I feel that the, the knowledge which exists over here is hierarchically structured. And that hierarchy decides whether the insights and ideas it comes from the end is it will be useful or not. And majority is that you know we outsiders, we persons with later, persons with technical knowledge, persons who have different race sense, who wear different dress sense, who talk in a different way, who decide how a technology should be. My 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 problem is that if we have technology for the unrest, following this way, following this trajectory, this will not benefit the unrest the way it is it is it is thought it will a technology will benefit. Uh, there is a is a conflict of an experience between when a researcher goes to the field, he goes with a set of assumptions. And now, as Mr. Francis has said, you know, in the name of participatory, uh, you know, a strategy, you know, we, we do it in a, in a tokenistic way. We go with our plan and we consult them and we say that we have taken their views and this is what the participation is all about. So, this is uh, uh, problematic and this needs to be changed. And the literature, even by the academics, literature suggests that new arrangements for methodologies have to be thought of. And if we can think through that, then the technology can really be to the benefit of the unrest. I will give you 
three examples before I stop. How we as very educated person spoil the spirit of the poor who are on a learning slope, who have insights. And let me tell you a story which is called Lindell's story. It became very popular among my Australian friends. Government of India has been, uh, you know, popularizing production of uh, uh, pulses, pulse uh, crops, because there is an alarming sense of uh, nutrition deficiency, and that has to be bridged. So a group of scientists visit the village and say that we are going to demonstrate the production of uh, a lintel. The farmers pleaded that this land, this plot of land, has never ever been for lintel. The scientists had all the formulations, they had all the data, they had soil health, they had wind wallace velocity, annual sunshine intensity and everything. And to top it all, they said that you are getting every input free of cost. So please, for the scientists, for us educated people, this may be something which is free, but if a farmer loses a plot for one cycle, he loses everything. Okay, this was tried and the lintel failed. It could not even germinate. And there was a high level review of and farmers were to be blamed. You did not take care. The reason which was which was investigated and found was that the 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 depth of sowing was not done properly because the tractor was being driven by somebody, a mechanic, who did not pay attention to what depth it took over. And it was the loss of lintel and the loss of money uh, you know, everything that farmers had for a Now, taking this, we had another story from the same tribal community where we wanted another crop. And the farmers and the technologists were suggesting a number of things to do. The farmer said, no, not this, not this, not this. No wheat, because wheat uh, is eaten by the, the elephants. So we will go for mustard. And they went for mustard. And uh, there was uh, a zero tillage technology used. In part, it fed. But the farmers realized their own mistake. And they said, like the lintel, we also could not consider the, 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 the death. But they said the, the mistake is partly us, but more from the scientists. And next year, the whole uh, group of people, the entire village planted mustard. And one could see how mustards, yellow flowers are, you know, flowering in the, in, in the landscape of the tribal village. No damage by the elephants and nothing. Then, you know, there was a, a big discussion which was organized. And I'm very happy to share with you that all the scientists and engineers from the same university Agriculture University agreed that because we did not pay much heed to the wisdom of the farmers, it's unrisked. Then, because of that, we could not let the technology in the benefit that farmers should have. So, uh, with this, there was, there was an arrangement that the university, and I'm very happy to share with you the involvement of IIT Kharagpur. Uh, four students have joined on the project, and this is fully funded by Australian Center for International Agriculture, Agriculture Research. And, you know, starting from uh, soil testing to seed certification, to seed to crop choices, seeds, 
So involvement in the entire value chain is by the tribal community. The technology of uh, you know protected farming, the technology of zero tillage is all you know done jointly by the scientists and the tribal. My prescription to to, to this August uh, audience is that if the scientists, if the technologists, if we educated people all learn some of the things which we have learned over time, if we de-structure ourselves, if we try to set some of the you know, power that we perceive that we as an educated person have over the Andres, it's something which can help take the technology to the farmers, to the Andres. As a, as a, as a, as a recommendation, I would like to say that the time has come that Andres, although maybe 40% or 30%, this is a critical mass. And if all of us are citing Mahatma Gandhi, if there is a turbulence in this small proportion, we are not going to be peaceful. Gandhi's uh, teachings are going to prove to die. So we have to pay much attention. So because the technology and you know scientific uh, uh, innovations are considered as the as the domain of highly educated people. We need to have a little shift, and we need, need to have some element of unlearning from what we have learned over time in a very, very hierarchical way. And I have tried with my students, I have four PhD students, uh, two from uh, IIT Kharagpur, two from uh, Maman Singh, Bangladesh Agricultural University, and they are working so well, you know, agriculture, sociologists, anthropologists, and the, 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 the tribal community. So the, co the element of cognitive justice has to come in full play. And if we, we work together to prepare this kind of arrangement where we work in harmony, the unreached are not unlettered, are not, they don't lack insight. They have greater insight. They, have, they breathe in the air. They, they, they are there for years. So, uh, our learning of the last 20, 22 years is that if a technology has to go to the benefit of the, the unrest, I'm not comfortable, again, with this, this word, uh, with these marginalized uh, communities, let us once again try to be treat them as partner. Let us not sympathize with them. Let's empathize with them. Treat them as partner. It's a, it, 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 it may sound very, very unrealistic. How come the person who has never gone beyond primary school of Uttar Chakwakheti, the village he was, how can he be a partner? But their partnership is, is much more fruitful, not only for them, but also for your research, also for the research of we who uh, read papers, who publish papers, who make publications in national and international journals. And there is a great hope with this collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mishra.